I want to start by saying how much of a thrill it is to speak to you. Um, I was in public radio for a number of years. I never attended a regional conference, <clears throat> let alone spoke at one. And to be here, they only let the important people come. Clearly. So um, it's really an honor and a thrill. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. And um, anything you want to say? Yeah, it's just good to be here. I mean, this is like a weird mixture of my past. I see my Colorado public radio family, former family in the audience, my GBH News people, NPR fam. So it's good to be here. Cool. So um, we have kind of an unusual construct for this uh, conversation this morning. Yeah. We're going to talk to each other. Yeah. I'm going to move actually a little bit more, so I'm looking towards you. And uh, we, we uh, formatted this around uh, uh, a thing called oblique strategies. And oblique, if you don't know what oblique strategy cards are, and I'm sure many of you don't, this is a box of them right here. They were created by musician and artist Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt. And it's a deck of cards that, you're, that artists are supposed to look at when they are stuck or they want to find a different way to approach a problem. And you just open the box, you pull out any random card, and you try to do what the card says. The cards are not, most of the cards are very difficult to apply to situations, but it forces you to think differently. So for example, I, I, there's a Twitter account that just puts one of these up every single day, and so I just grabbed a bunch of them. So like, for example, a card is what to increase, what to reduce. Like, how do I apply that to the problem that I'm facing? Another one is question the heroic approach. You know, not a very linear pathway to solving a problem, but it just gets you to think differently. Breathe more deeply. Lee, when he looked at this deck, thought we, I was going like, to lead a meditation I with you we folks. I thought were doing like, yoga <laughs> when I saw this. OK, but here we go. Right. Go to the extreme, move back to a more comfortable place. Do the washing up. I think that's it. So let me back up a second. So Lee and I have each written three cards that we would include in the public radio future deck of what you would, you can think about to, as you solve problems, things to keep in mind. And we're going to share each of our uh, cards, explain a little bit about why we wrote that and talk about it. And then when we're through all six, we have two microphones here and we can have a conversation with you about things you think or disagree with or with kind of like, I don't understand what the hell you're talking about. So we'll just uh, try to go through these and see how we do. So Lee is first. His first card is who is not paying attention to what you're doing. Why did you come up with that, sir? Yeah, so I came up with that. And it's so interesting because John Lansing yesterday gave the interesting statistic of, you know, 20%, upwards of 20% of people of color, young people of color, don't even know who or what NPR is. And so um, I feel like, you know, we've both been in this orbit for many years, almost 20 years now for me, and I know you've been at it for a while. I feel like so many times we can get so... Um, into ourselves, and I described it on the phone with you as getting high off of our own supply uh, in public media, that we, um, that we are not really paying attention to who's not listening to us, to who's not taking in what we're doing. And so um, shout out to my colleagues uh, from GBH, Pam, my boss and partner, uh, general manager. Um, you know, we recently commissioned research uh, to understand who our audience was and who it was not and really paying attention to, um, we know we have the, you know, liberal Volvo driving, Eastern seaboard educated uh, audience, but who is not listening to public radio? Who should be? Who's not consuming our content? Who should be? And so we're really trying to create strategies around reaching people, for instance, not just black and brown people, but young people who might be getting their news on TikTok or Instagram. And what might, how might it look if we were really building strategies to bring more people into the public media fold who um, don't know about us yet, but we have an opportunity to meet them where they are. And that's everywhere. So that's what I'm thinking when I think about that, when I wrote and that. And I think there, you talk about getting high on our own supply. Um, I think sometimes public radio speaks so insularly about itself. That's right. That it talks past the audience it already has. Right. Let alone the people that it's trying to reach. 
Right. I mean, it's like really trying to, and I tell people in, in different newsrooms that I've been in or run, you know, how would you explain this story to your mother or your cousin who might not even know what public media is, who might not even be a consumer of news? I want to go after those people. I want to go after the people who are, you know, low potential public media consumers and try and bring them in. Um, everyone wants a more informed public. Everyone wants to be armed with information when they're voting. Everyone wants, um, you know, uh, uh, a society where there's equity, um, hopefully. Well, some people don't. But we want to go after the people who do. Uh, and so I just think that there are endless opportunities for us to think outside of our bubble to reach people who are, I hate to say this word, but non-traditional audience members. And, and it's good business. And it is good business. I mean, if we look at statistics in terms of, you know, major donors and people, I know at some places you call them evergreen, people who give the same amount every month or people who die and leave their houses and cars. Well, those people are getting older and they're aging out. So what are the new membership models to bring in millennials? And if you can't contribute $5, maybe you can, you know, be an influencer and share GBH News content on your platforms. Um, and so I think it also calls for some disruption in paying attention to who's not, you know, watching, listening, but also who's not giving. And be open to non-traditional ways. Different listeners will give different ways. That's right. Um, let's move on to our next card, shall we? So this is my contribution. Uh, forget the map, find a compass. Tell us about it. Um, so this is the difference between you know, a map and a compass. A map shows you in fr it, it is a guide to you of knowing what is going to happen next. Right. And if you want to get to a certain place, the route you need to go in order to get to that place. It's like directions. A compass is more picking a place and not really knowing what obstacles lie between you and that place and accepting that as part of the process of getting there. That not every direction you take is going to be the right one. Right that you may have to backtrack and go around a mountain in order to get past the mountain. And that if you think of vision in the same way, uh, it gives you a lot more permission to not always need to be right all the time. Right. Because as I long think, as you know what direction you're headed in. Right, right, right. Exactly. As long as you, you have that, your North and, Star, your And it's not like a compass like we're going here. It's like we're going here. That's right. And uh, a couple months ago, there's, well, a couple months. It's been going on for years, this conversation about talent drain in, in the public radio industry, which people come to me a lot. A lot of the people who leave call me, and if I haven't heard from them in a couple years, I'm like, I know what this call is about before we get on the call. And this is the issue they talk about. This is the issue. It's not money. It's not creative freedom. It's I look and I don't see a vision. Some maps are good. Uh, a budget is a map. A strategic plan is a map. But that's not a vision that someone can look at and say, I get where you're going, and it's exciting, and I want to be part of that. Right, and they can locate themselves in that vision. Right, right, right. exactly. Right. Um, I, I want to digress. I'm actually going to take a kind of disproportional amount of time for this card for a second, because I want to tell you a quick story. Bangkok. About, uh, yeah, oh. about something that happened to me in Bangkok, and this is, this is totally appropriate. It's fine. Um, this is a photograph of me um, right before the pandemic, a couple months before the pandemic, on a boat. It's more like a canoe with a, a car engine strapped to the back. It was quite a harrowing trip. Uh, I was in Bangkok to record the, what became the, the pilot for a series uh, I did with um, Ted called Far Flung with uh, Salim Rashamwala. And we were going to Bangkok to talk about coastal erosion and how they, coastal erosion and flooding and environmental impact of, 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 or the real life impact of climate change, which is a very real thing. If you doubt that, that used to be a road 10 years ago, and it's now like a waterway where boats go through. And while I was there, people kept talking about a radio station. It was on in every taxi. Everyone had a story about this radio station. It's called JS Ma or JS 100. It is a radio station in Bangkok that started about 25 years ago with the intention of being a news and information radio station, traffic, news, weather. You know the drill, right? 
So there's a couple problems in Bangkok. There is no centralized system for reporting traffic. There is no centralized system to report weather. There is no centralized system to know what the police are doing or the fire is doing. There is not even a, in Bangkok, a city of eight and a half million people, there is not even a 911 system. And you know who fills a lot of those gaps? JS100. Please keep it up on the slides, please. So um, uh, JS100 faced all these obstacles to becoming what they wanted to be. They had no money, no infrastructure. And like, well, here's an idea. Let's ask our listeners to provide all the information. And that's what they did. They invented crowdsourcing 15 years before that was even a term. And it is the largest station in Bangkok by a huge, it's literally on everywhere. And the community talks to themselves through the radio station. And after this started going for a couple of years, something really amazing started to happen. People started to call in with problems and situations that had nothing to do with traffic or weather or news. Um, my dementia or, or, or Alzheimer's grandmother has wandered away. She's wearing an orange dress. Does anyone see her? People call in the radio station, and they found grandma. They, uh, the reason I first got turned on to them is I was following a police unit. and like, how did the police unit get dispatched? Oh, the taxi, a taxi driver called the radio station. I'm like, what? And I witnessed crazy things that this radio station was doing. One, the one that was most profound to me, I actually talked my way in. Um, I, 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 like, I had no intention of being involved in this. I actually, through my translator, talked my way into visiting the radio station. That's basically their hub where all their um, producers work, and they're taking phone calls. They're taking things off of an app they have. And um, it's, it's kind of crazy the, to watch the setup of these, like about 10 people talking to the community, da databasing everything, and then doing uh, uh, amazing things to solve problems for people in that moment. I witnessed, while I was in that room, um, a guy in an, driving an ambulance called in. He had a guy in the back of his ambulance who was having a heart attack and they were stuck in traffic. JS100 called the guy who controls all the traffic lights in Bangkok and turned every traffic light green between where they were in the hospital. And the guy was fine. Right? And I could go on, I won't, but at the reception, give me another beer too, I'll tell you more JS100 stories. Um, you, know, you see, they're, 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 they're basically, but they make them into mini narratives. When another one I saw was an old woman found a python in her house, didn't know how to get the python out. So listeners started calling in to suggest this is how you get a python out of your house. And those didn't work because we got a call up again and the old lady's like, this isn't working. So the radio station said, is anyone in her neighborhood able to go over and get the python? And listeners to the station went to her house, got the python, called into the radio station as they're removing the python, and you get to follow along in real time. I made everyone I met in, in, in Bangkok who spoke English translate basically what's happening on the radio. And so uh, uh, this is the, uh, in the air studio, this is the international sign of why someone walking into the uh, on air studio in the middle of my talk set. And they were so kind of honored and flattered and confused by my enthusiasm, they decided to put this enormous excited white man on the radio and interviewed me live. <laughs> so I, you see my translator pilot in there with me. And, I was sitting there, and you won't believe this, but this is God's sworn truth. When that photo was taken, I'm being interviewed on the radio, and I was thinking about my career in public broadcasting. I was thinking about how these people do more tangible public service in a day than how many years of my career to match that. They are literally saving lives every day. They are improving that community every day. And they did it with nothing. It's like OG community engagement. It is. Yeah. It is. And, I, and I'm like, now whenever I hear someone complain, like I'm doing consulting or strategic planning, and people complain about not having enough resources, I'm like, I don't want to hear it. I just don't want to hear it. Because it just shows the drive of vision just conquers, slays dragons. And it's just electric. So at, uh, I'll be at the reception again tonight. Happy to talk more about JS100. We've taken up more time. But essentially, it, what it is, is meeting the needs of the community, right? It's, it's figuring out what the jobs are that need to be done and, yes. it is and asking, standing in the gap. It, what they did is they said, write this down, what are the problems in my community that I am uniquely positioned to help solve? And they built 
from that. Not like, what do I, assets do I have? Or how do we get people to listen to us? Right. Yeah. They believed that if they would create something that was solving problems in the community, that people would support them. And this is a commercial station, by the way. This is not a public station. That's amazing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Let's move on. So. Okay. Wow. Sorry to follow up. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so seek out people who don't look or think like you. So this is, I wrote this. Um, I am thinking of Senator Roy Blunt, the, um, the senator from Missouri, and announcing whether he would support Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, said something like, um, she is competent, she is qualified, she, is, she meets the moment, but I am going to vote no because the way that she sees the world and moves through the world makes me uncomfortable. And essentially that's what he said. And, and while he understood the moment and the need for you know, a radical transformation of a historic institution by having a black woman sit on the high court, that he was going to take a hard pass because she made him uncomfortable. While public media stations and newsrooms are not the high court, um, I would invite all of us to, although if you look at the United States Senate, which is predominantly cishet white men, and if we were to do an assessment of public radio station managers and boards, which might have a striking comparison, that would be a great outcome from this meeting if we were to do that assessment of, of public media stations. Um, you know, it is about how one chooses to use their power. And so I would invite all of us to um, give ourselves permission in hiring to think about bringing in people who um, make the way we see the world or the way we think about the world, um, who challenge us a little bit, who uh, disrupt us a little bit, um, to think outside of the box. Uh, because I think with what we need in this industry is radical, you know, we need radical transformation and diversity and equity and inclusion. And you, I would challenge us to think about how to make that happen when um, we have leadership that in some ways is very homogenous. Um, so we want outcomes that look like the mosaic of America and the mosaic of this world, but sometimes we're not willing to infiltrate um, the way we uh, you know, set up our boards, the way we set up our leadership um, positions in our newsrooms. And so for, you know, I think, I remember talking to you about this on the phone, Eric, and you said, well, Lee, how do you, like, measure that, right? Because if you can't measure it, it can't happen. <laughs> so, if you can't measure it, it's not real. If you can't measure it, it's not real. So I'm thinking about it. In my previous station, there was a debate about um, whether we should do away with the requirement to have a college degree to work in our newsroom, whether that was something that was really necessary um, in order to get the life experience that we wanted to be at the table editorially, or whether we should, aside from the equal opportunity legalese that's on the bottom of all of our job descriptions, whether we more intentionally and aggressively recruit for people who, you know, might, um, you know, be people of faith or might be people who you know, um, grew up in middle America, or you know, some of these things we can't screen for because HR rules are crazy. But, um, but I would, you know, how much richer would our editorial coverage be if, if we were covering you know, anti-Muslim violence or uh, you know, attacks of violence at Sikh temple if we had Muslims at the table in our newsrooms um, and we were more aggressive and intentional about wanting people with diverse life experiences to work alongside us and do the work. So it's something that we're doing at GBH, really trying to you know, rethink our hiring practices and really um, trying to bring in people who reflect the communities that we serve. And the hypothesis is, is that if we have more content creators and reporters and producers who look like our region, in Boston or who look like America, then that might help the audience to better locate themselves in the stories that we're telling, in the news that we're reporting, in the headlines that we're sharing, and that creates a more informed public. I think yesterday during a session I sat in on uh, 
Rachel from Oklahoma, I can't remember, KOSU, right? It's been a, I, I'm getting rusty on these call letters. Um, she said that you should always be a little bit uncomfortable. You should always be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, I would take that a step further and say that if you're not doing something uncomfortable, you're not going to get anything worth having out of it. That's right. And it makes us better, right? Mm -hmm. I think it makes us better. It has the potential to make us better. And listen, as long as we have the shared mission of public media, and I think, um, I, can't, I can't remember her name, but the woman from WABE, the new general manager, was talking about the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967 and how this is actually in the DNA, supposedly, in what we're doing in the charter of public media is to welcome the other, to inform the other, to include the other. And what might it look like if we were, if we take the, age, the journalism um, age old saying of, you know, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comforted, what if we brought that into our hiring practices? I, I, I actually have a huge problem with that phrase. <laughs> uh, no, afflict the comfort and comfort the afflicted. It's very elitist and very regal. Yeah, but to the, to the extent of welcoming other people who challenge your point of view and who are different than you. Eric, we couldn't be more different, you and I. We're cool, we're friends, and we're doing this together. And I think that that is the magic of us being able to do something like this, is that we're able to take our different life paths, sit on the stage, and be able to talk to people about our experience and what's worked for us. True, true. You know, it's interesting, when you talk about the Public Broadcasting Act, um, I still, you know, I, I feel in some ways I feel I've never left public radio because because I grew up in public radio. So many of my friends are public radio people, so I talk to somebody at least once a week. And every once in a while when I'm with someone... Wait, you talk to a public radio friend person, once a week? Yeah, at least. That's like a meme. Right? Yeah. Now, <laughs> some of my best friends work in public radio. That's a meme, too. Hey. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, you know, texting or talking or whatever. And when I'm with people, sometimes I'll say, if, you know, the best... Actually, the most provocative ideas in the Public Broadcasting Act is not in the letter that E.B. White wrote or in the, the act itself. It was in Johnson's, um, uh, uh, the thing he said at the signing ceremony. He asked a number of questions about what this new medium can do and what it should aspire to. And it's actually incredibly uh, uh, provocative to read because you should, and the reason I bring this up is whenever people want to talk about the future, I always say, look at those questions that Lyndon B. Johnson asked of public broadcasting when he signed the bill. And if he, someone was saying that in 2022, what would the answers be? A, they'd be different, completely different. And you would reach different people with it. And maybe his questions would be different. And it wouldn't be broadcasting with the answer for many of those things. Right. Right? So it is, it's, it's, and when you welcome people in, you get those voices in who can answer some of those questions in a way that was different than you answered it when you were asked to answer it. Right. It's like um, Colin Cheadle yesterday, Don Cheadle's brother. Did y'all know that that was Don Cheadle's brother? It looks just like him. But anyway, there was a section in our group where we talked about not only respecting differences, but honoring differences. And what is the difference between those two things? One is, you know, we tolerate you. Might be glad you're here fulfill one of our, you know, strategic goals in terms of quotas. Please play by our rules. <laughs> right. But are we honoring you? Are we giving you agency to bring and stand in your own truth and be your whole authentic self and tying a thread from that to how we super serve our audience? Cool. Let's next going. slide. Our next card. Podcasting. Not the devil, not the savior. I didn't write this. This is mine. <laughs> When I talk to those public radio people, half of them are like, oh man, podcasting is going to be the death of us. And the other half are like, podcasting is the future, and we need to just drop everything and run in that direction. And whenever I hear those two things, I say, you're both wrong. What is it? Um, there are plenty of things that could kill public broadcasting. Perhaps that's for discussing uh, public radio. Uh, it's discussing uh, after over a beer tonight. Um, uh, and all of them are internal. They're not external threats by the way. Um, uh, and it's not going to be the savior. It'll be part of a future, but it won't be the future. And one of the things that concerns me as someone who works in podcasting every day and talks to people and, and, and several of my clients that I work with 
to do strategic work in public radio are really, really focused on podcasting. And I almost universally find that their understanding of podcasting and what it takes to be successful in podcasting is far, far, far removed from reality. And that they are making judgments about podcast strategy based off the perception of success rather than actual success. So let's play a game, okay? Everyone here, only station people can answer this. If you're from a network, don't raise your hand. Uh, how many people in this room, your station is producing and distributing podcasts? Pretty much everybody. Okay, hands down. How many of you have one podcast in your portfolio that consistently gets 50,000 downloads a month or more? 50,000 downloads per month or more. One, two, three, four, five. say 10. How many people in the room have a single podcast in their portfolio that gets 200,000 downloads per month consistently? One, believe that. One. Right. So why do those numbers matter? 50,000 downloads per month is really the threshold to get a um, CPM rate that you hear about and read, uh, like the $25 CPM rate. So you, you don't qualify for those unless you get national buys, and you have to have that kind of downloads in order to even qualify for like the blue box or the blue apron or blue whatever, right? So, you, and you can't even be part of those conversations about 50,000. And 200,000 is a really interesting number because that's the number of downloads you have to have per month to support one full-time employee. One. One station in this room has hit that, hit that mark. That's, I, I, I will tell you, that's a really hard mark to hit. And a lot of companies who are in podcasting or who are creating a lot of content you see and perceive as success are given tons of money to burn. And you're competing against a phantom. And the other thing that bothers me about a lot of public radio strategy towards podcasting is you are now unshackled from the bounds of FCC regulations for nonprofit broadcasters, running towards the models, story types, and, and distribution patterns, and everything else that commercial podcasting is using. And very few people that I'm aware of are saying, what does public radio mean in the podcast landscape? Public radio is magical. It creates something that cannot be duplicated. The big problem you've been talking about with DE and I is really about how do you take that magic and create that magic for people who want, you want them to experience that magic. That magic is so powerful that everyone in this room, I think except for me, everyone in this room has devoted your career to making that magic happen and bringing that magic to more people. And public you know, uh, commercial podcasting is not going to destroy you. What it has done is it has cramped your ability to be distinct. They have chipped in on the margins of doing things that you used to be able to say, we're the only people who do this. Now there are others, right? So you can hold on to your, defend your little territory which is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Or you can say, what is distinct? What's the white space that they aren't thinking about? What's the white space they can't occupy? Because commercial podcasters completely lack a long-term vision for podcasting. It's all what's happening in the next six months. People do not spend $300 million on a podcast company and decide they're going to wait five years for it to work out. It needs to start paying back right away. Do you think the podcasting bubble will ever burst? I hope it does. And then what? Um, I, I, I have long thought about this, and I am very comfortable with the chaos that, that, will, that will create. A lot of people will exit the podcasting space. They weren't in it for the right reasons anyhow. Um, there are a number of media companies, and I would, I, I'm not going to name names, but I think there are some even name in the them. public on. broadcasting space for whom podcasting is keeping the budget in the black. And if that were to go away, what are the ramifications of that? And that's why I would fear a podcast bubble bursting. But 
if it bursts, um, there's not going to be less listeners. There's going to be less people competing. There are 2,000 new podcasts a day competing with the 2,000 new podcasts that came out yesterday. And the 2,000 are coming. It's like impossible. And hundreds of thousands of new episodes a day. Yeah, oh, I, I, and I, I knew that number and I've forgotten it. But it was, it's a ridiculous number. Yeah. I think it's 150,000 new episodes yeah. a day. I think that's right. It's, it's a crazy competitive space. So instead of trying to just play that game, which you don't have the resources and you don't have the, 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 the long-term durability to win, why not create your own space? That's what public radio did in 1967, or public broadcasting did, is defined a space where others are not going to go, right. but there's huge opportunity. Do you have any more guiding questions that stations should be asking other than, because I feel like that white space is getting smaller and smaller as the zone is no, more and more cluttered. Completely. No, I disagree completely. No, we're standing in the corner of the room right now looking, we're standing in the corner of the room looking at the corner and our hands are up like this and talking about this expansive wild west of podcasting. And if we just turn around, there's a whole other room. I, I, you know, I, the number of podcasts last year was equal to the number of websites in 1997. I don't know what the current number is. 1997. I think the internet has found new ways to use that technology to its advantage since 1997. And I think podcasting is going to be the same way. So enough of time on that. We need to move on. Got a lot of more questions about that. But experiment with everything, rinse, retro, try again. This is me. I just feel like sometimes it is easy for us to cling to if it's not broke, don't fix it, um, versus trying new things um, and really building a culture of experimentation. I think that um, you know several people know that GBH News just uh, really um, launched a new version of Morning Edition that is uh, really designed intentionally to sound much more as Pim says it, much more like a podcast than, uh, than an actual radio show. And that's something that we, um, we launched in February and it's really been interesting to get the feedback of, of um, you know, people who were listening to that experiment with two 27 year olds at the mic in the mornings. And you know, we're also thinking about what it looks like to build a newsroom without walls and to take our newsroom to the people not, and to take the journalism to the people rather than waiting for people to come to the journalism and uh, being out in the communities more, doing journalism in different places and, and really changing who we do journalism for and with. Um, these are experiments. Uh, and I think that, you know, for us to stay relevant, I think we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we need to stop doing, that we are doing, and what are the new things that we need to do um, to introduce what we're doing to a whole new generation of listeners, of users, of, you know, for those of us who are joint licensees and have television stations, uh, watchers, viewers, um, and I think that that has to include baked in to it, a, a strategy of experimentation and, you know, throwing some things at the wall, trying it, willing to have honest conversations about whether it works, whether it doesn't work. I'll give an example of something I did in my previous role as EP at The Takeaway was um, we experimented with Amy Walter at the time with micro podcasts around how to vote in America. Um, and basically like five minute downloads just to really unpack the primary process and give people a little bit of election civic competence in like five or six minutes or less. Not too many people listened. And, <laughs> and, so, and so, but, but you gave the answer earlier when you talked about the, the, the look back. The look back. You, you can't just experiment. You have to build in an equal process of how you're going to reward the experiment even when it doesn't work as you wanted it to. Right, reward the experiment and reward the people who are willing to right. experiment. Reward the people who are raising their hand and saying, I don't know if this is gonna work, but I'm willing to try it because we can learn something. So we tried it for two or three months, looked at the numbers, um, tried it I think maybe for a few more weeks after that, and then we decided to cease and desist and talk about it, extract learnings from it, and, and think about how it might inform our strategy going forward. I think that is very healthy muscle memory to have in this landscape, to be willing to try new things, have honest conversations about whether they work, whether they don't, know when it's time to stop something, 
because I feel like we're, we can all be a little trigger happy and we're always starting new stuff and building new things, but not necessarily knowing the wisdom around sunsetting um, because that's a thing too. Uh, and so, and, and being open to trying again. So, um, yeah. a, a little bit of appear into the weirdness of Amazon culture. Um, when you go in to ask for funding for a project, you go in with one sheet of paper, both sides. You have, that's all you get to describe your project. And you go in to the executive review, you ask for the money, and they, in the room, they give you a thumbs up or thumbs down, and you walk out with the money. It could be millions of dollars. Right? And back up, because I don't want to assume that everybody knows how I, you have this knowledge. Right. I used to work for Amazon, and, uh, uh, mostly based in the Audible division, but I had a lot of exposure outside of Audible to the rest of the Amazon ecosystem, um, even uh, Amazon Music's early um, uh, efforts in podcasting and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, the, uh, y and then you go do the project, and then you come back for your second executive review. And in that review, you're asked how did it go. And if you go in there and kind of paint a layer of BS over your results, you're probably going to get fired. Uh, if you go in and say, oh, we didn't get anything close to what we expected, we, the next question out of the the uh, mouth of the first person to speak is, well, what did you learn? Because the attitude is, we didn't invest necessarily in the outcome you thought, we were investing in you learning. Mm. And the people you worked with learning. Because now you've got these lumps, your, your muscles are a little harder, and now you're smarter for the next thing you go ask for. And it's, it's it baked into the culture of, don't sugarcoat your results. Don't try to give me a press release of your results. Go in, and uh, I was counseled, Go in and start with what you screwed up, right? Um, and, then, uh, and then talk about the things that went right. Because no project, everything goes right. So very good. Let's move, last slide, last card. Um, this is center on the listener. And uh, I was talking with a, a friend a couple weeks ago about a project. And uh, I had written up like, my idea of the project two sides of a piece of paper. It, it's a habit that dies hard. Um, and uh, they said, oh, you should take the mentions of listener in here and replace them with audience. Because, and I know Lee, Lee agrees with this too, like, like, like think about audience because it immediately gravitates you into a space of um, thinking how you can reach people that aren't just there listening. Um, I have a tremendous concern when I, I, I hear people in public radio talking, even even in the few sessions I've been able to sit in here, um, that the conversation is not focused around listening. And the danger in that is that if you look at what public radio has been, and you look at what I hear people talking about wanting to be an arts institution, the newsroom of record, all these other things, regardless if anyone actually wants a newsroom of record, <laughs> um, I see you in a middle space. And I believe that the way to get to that future is by returning to the past to some degree. Um, I did a lot of listening to public radio during the pandemic and was shocked at how little responsiveness I heard to what was going on in that pandemic. News stories, yes, but like adjustments of when shows aired, adjustments of, it, it sounded like almost like everything was normal and nothing was normal. You mean the clock actually, the clocks, literally the schedule. Clocks and schedules. Yep. How little adjustments were made. And Frankly, and I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you, I hear a lot of stations that don't sound that much different than they sounded five or seven or ten years ago in their approach to their sound. Um, and that concerns me because you're still in that space of moving from here to here. And you need that foundational space of listening to be healthy and strong to power and fuel your motion. You won't get to that point in the future unless there's a solid foundation in your relationship with listeners. And as you expand out who those listeners are, which you should, and you're thinking about how do we expand, like your credibility and your competence is in creating that magic, the things to be listened to. And mm. I think that you know, YouTube is great, video is great, all these other, you know, the newsletters, all this stuff, those are all great, but they don't work unless the foundation under them is really healthy. And I just wish I could find a way with you know, my incredibly limited capacity to, 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 to help with this of 
drawing attention back to how much more that relationship has yet to give you between a listening audience and your station. You said something interesting at breakfast this morning talking about the bread and butter of stations. Yeah. And how much of your money is coming from that listening relationship? Right. Most of it, if not all of it, many percent. Right. So that, I think, needs to be recognized. If you want that to not be the case, and, I, and, and I've talked to people who say that you know, we're not even tapping into financially what, what could be uh, the, the relationship with the current audience. And there's so much more that we can be drawing out of that. Yeah, That's and I would say further center on the listener, both current and perspective. The listeners yes. you have and the listeners you want, the listeners you don't have, and what does it look like to center on people who are not even in your sphere yet? Don't lose sight of that listening as you worry about the future. No. So we'll do some questions. We have 14 minutes left. Not bad. I was hoping we had 15 to 20. We kind of hit it on the nose. Yeah, we did. Questions. So there's two mics, and you must go to the mic to ask a question, even if you have a big voice because um, uh, it's being recorded and we want other people to understand what you said so we don't have to repeat it. So, any questions? And say your name, say locate yourself in the public media universe where you're from, it's your favorite color, you don't oh, have to say geez. that. But. Joyce Slocum, Texas Public Radio, based in San Antonio, and uh, noted as a troublemaker. And a former interim CEO at NPR. Oh, and our general counsel, and we love <laughs> right, her. Right. We worked with and Joyce. Eric and day. I put together the TED News or the TED Radio Hour. That's so right. There we you did. go. That's right. Um, uh, you talk about CPMs, and we're having a spirited debate at uh, TPR about whether selling on CPM is really the future of podcast, or is it selling based on sponsor affinity? and convincing them that they are going to reach a really targeted audience interested in what they have to say. And I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Um, for people who don't know what CPMs are, could you elaborate? Yeah, CPM, that's a good point to bring up because I didn't know what it was until I was fairly late in my tenure at NPR. I'd never heard the term before. It's, the, it, it's CPM being the Roman numeral for thousands, cost per thousand. So if you have 100,000 listeners, you have a CPM of 100. If you have 45,000 listeners, you have a CPM of 45. And so someone says, I'm going to buy a podcast ad for you to pay $20. You, CPM, you take the 20 and multiply it by the number of thousands you have. Got it. That's how you figure out what the, the price is. And uh, a, a, a fairly average national buy for the fairly average sponsor uh, in podcasting is about $23. And... Uh, locals can, local can go down into the teens um, or less than that. Um, broadcast, I think, is in single digits when you figure it out. Um, and a lot of the conversation around advertising goes there. So, so to answer Joyce's question, um, I, I think this is both an incredibly exciting way of thinking and also incredibly dangerous. Incredibly exciting because I do think that I don't like the CPM way of, of monetizing podcasts. Right? It's, 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 it, I just find advertising just in general kind of gross. Not necessarily the idea of advertising, but the way it's bought and sold. And, uh, and the exclusion of so many people from that system. It's really, you have lots of companies that are, in the, uh, uh, even inside of public radio, their efforts to try to bundle things together. That's really difficult to make work. Because you're basically hoping that everybody does exactly what they're supposed to do. I mean, this is why so many people get shut out of podcast advertising, because the levels are so low. Um, the advertisers just don't want to deal with all these different people because they have no way of controlling it. Right? So any way that gets you outside of that thinking, I think anything that gets you away from advertising as being the sole source of revenue, I pick on this all the time. People say, podcasting is a billion dollar a year industry. I'm like, no, it's probably a $3 billion a year industry because you're factoring out all the other forms of revenue other than advertising, which is a derivative rights, which is a, a kind of institutional sponsorship, which is, and there's one more I can't recall off the top, oh, <laughs> direct listener contributions. Anytime someone gives you money through Patreon or supporting cast or Apple podcast subscriptions, or they give you money uh, through purchasing merchandise or all these type of things, um, that's, that's where all the growth lies in podcasting. And podcasting is so fixated on CPM. The reason it's dangerous, real quickly, is 
beware of becoming sponsored content. Because someone will look at that, a company, a foundation, lots of people will look at that investment in making that podcast as being, I am paying to put this message out in the world. And the public radio station or the uh, production company, um, there's nothing wrong with sponsored content. But if you are a nonprofit and you are trying to operate, you're operating a newsroom in which you're trying to be fair and impartial, um, that could really come back and haunt you. So I think it's... And there are a lot of stations that are building really interesting membership models around podcasting. Uh, that's although, a huge thing. Yeah. It's, it's a huge thing. We have a lot more to learn, but uh, there's a lot of evolution there. Hi. Hi. I know that face. Hi. It's Jennifer Farrell from KCRW in Los Angeles. And um, I think I'm at that part in my career where I don't have to ask a question. I can just make a... I can just pontificate and then walk away and let you do it. Do a slow like, clap. Finally, there you go. I've, got, I've come to that point after 30 years. Um, so I guess one thing I've been thinking about, about what you've been talking about, is that you know we, we all have this real interest and need to widen our, our listenership and our audience base and to let more people into this, this beautiful system that we have. And I, I, we're at this place in our, in our public radio life where we really are, are fixated on journalism. And again, I believe in it and I trust it and I'm so glad we're in that space. But the beautiful part of what we do is often in the space that's not in journalism. It's in culture, it's in music, it's in those weird stories that come out of what we do. And I think that's a really, it's a big place to allow people to come in for creativity. And so when we talk about journalists and looking for journalists of color, I have read a, res a statistic, and I could be wrong, but of all the journalists out there, 4% are, are black. That is a really small pool that we're all competing for to get those voices in our, in our newsrooms. And what if we looked at our newsrooms in a different way, and we said, we want storytellers and creators. Bring your weird stuff. Come here to this place and be weird, and we're going to support you, and we're going to grow this audience together. So anyway, yeah. that's not a question. It's a statement, and I just want you to all think about it. But it, it brings <laughs> up something real quickly, if I could. Yeah. Um, uh, I may become incredibly unpopular by saying this. Uh, I do not buy that making your newsroom bigger is the, only, is the pathway to becoming more relevant in, an, in, a, in a community. I don't buy into the newsroom of record. I've never heard anybody actually ask for that before. Um, but there's a way of, it's, 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 having 50 reporters is a feature. It's not a benefit. And when, when you talk about what Jennifer's talking about, it's focusing on the benefits. What do you do with those 50 people? That's what makes you distinct. You know, newspapers, television, radio, all tried this uh, you know, newsroom of record in our communities, and they all failed. For different reasons, um, I don't hear a lot of conversations around why public radio's version of this attempt is learned anything. That doesn't mean that it's destined to fail because it's not, but be very careful about assuming that journalism has value. It's what you, I always describe journalism as a tool to do something else. What is that else? which brings you back to that um, uh, idea of what's the problem in my community that I can solve. Right. Well, I mean, I do believe that people increasingly need more trusted information, because I feel like the worst possible thing is a... Make the point you made at breakfast this morning about well, this. I forgot. It, the worst possible thing is a miseducated voter, an underinformed voter who goes into the booth and pulls the lever and doesn't understand the issues, doesn't understand the consequences of their vote. Um, and so I do believe, but I do believe that there's also something to be said about, you know, hacking audience funnels. And maybe we get people in through other ways. Maybe, you know, I don't know if anybody wants to like hear the news reported on TikTok, but, you know, if we bring them in through arts and culture and then, you know, link them back to, you know, what we're doing at GBH News, that could be a win. But how about if they never meet right. us on the terrestrial radio right. dial? Right. If they never meet us, you know, uh, on channel two uh, for us, then that doesn't mean that we failed because our goal is to introduce what we're doing to a new generation of folks who can connect with public media in new ways. I think that journalism is core to our democracy and what we're doing. And I think oh, journalism is great. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. It's you what you do with the journalism. journalism. Important. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but I think that we're in it. I think we're in peril without it. But what did I say at breakfast? You basically said the same thing about yeah, not, okay. not needing to, you know, serving someone on TikTok and then that's where they'd stay. Right. Has value. Yeah. Ernesto Aguilar with KQED in San Francisco. Lee, I'm wondering if you could dig a little bit deeper into this conversation you brought up about hiring folks that help disrupt our way of thinking. And also, any thoughts you might have on how people in this room can help contribute to internal cultures where that value isn't always shared and sometimes, whether explicitly or implicitly, walls start to go up and how we can start to break those things down within our own organizations. Yeah, thank you for that. So I think that, um, you know, we need to think differently about how we recruit and where we are recruiting from. I actually don't think it's just the role of human resources or the recruiting department to find new people. I think, you know, we should all be ambassadors of whatever. Uh, we should believe in wherever we're working um, enough to feel empowered to be ambassadors for that institution. And the, day you stop believing and feeling empowered to be an ambassador for that institution is the day you need to leave. But I do think that we can create more opportunities, you know, through ERGs and through, you know, affinity groups within organizations to celebrate and honor differences and to over communicate that you are welcome here and this is a place for you. Um, and so I think that, you know, we're still learning. I think that, you know, um, a lot of that has to do with being open at the top. We're all hiring managers, I would think, I, self included, and really thinking about, you know, am I, you know, hiring for someone who I personally have affinity with, um, who sees the world the way I do, or am I hiring for someone who, um, you know, is maybe going to disrupt our culture in a way that's healthy and maybe help us make our content relevant to a broader group of people? Um, and so I think it's TK, as they say in the newspaper business. I think it's ever evolving what that looks like, but I think the, the power is in asking the right questions and being willing to get answers that might make you not feel so great. Hello, I'm Jackie Gills Webb from CPB, and I just love the stories about the station in Bangkok. <laughs> it made me think back to when radio began um, I, I did a radio documentary on the history of black radio and the station in Memphis, Tennessee, WDIA, was helping people find false teeth and chickens and things like that. But then my mind went to today, where we have small stations in rural communities that are doing just that, sick and shut in. Who are the seniors you need to visit? That's right. Um, and, but, I, but I also thought about the fact that the larger the stations are, they lose that for more of a mm -hmm. slicker sound. Mm -hmm. So where, how can we um, make sure that when we do get large, that we don't get too big for our britches and still acknowledge the strong local connections that we have with our listeners, like the station in Bangkok did, so that we can somehow hold on to that community connection? That's a really beautiful point to bring up. So I would say be in, make it your business to be in constant communication with your constituents, the public. Yeah. Um, you know, before you're reporting, you know, while you're reporting a story, after you're reporting, if it has nothing to do with reporting, make it your business to be in constant communication, uh, boots on the ground, boots on the ground, ears to the ground about what are the needs of your community. Create sort of general, I'm a, I, I was also came through when I was at Colorado Public Radio, I was with the Public Insight Network and helped build that there. And so a big philosophy around that was having your ear to the ground and creating arteries and channels for people to reach out to you with the philosophy of the time to seek a friend or sources before you need one. Um, and so understand constantly what the needs of the community are and make it known that that is important to you. So in your strategic plans, in your messaging to the public, making sure that you are underlining, we are here because of you. We are doing what we are doing because of you and we cannot do it without it, without you. And so, you know, I think in those conversations, the needs of the community will always be coming at you regardless of how big you get. And 
the distinction you make between the rural stations, I know I, I've, I've listened to a number of them that exist. You know, uh, it's, it's amazing to hear those type of things happening, sometimes in between network programs, right? Um, I do not buy the idea that a large market station couldn't come, a large market public radio station couldn't come up with something kind of like JS100. Because the vibe there, which they never say, but it's just so obvious, is that we are a community. We're eight and a half million people, right? But we're a community, and we need each other. And it is very, and the thing that's just so inspiring about it, getting goosebumps thinking about it now, is that that staff, the CEO of the station, when I was talking to her, cried. Because she was so committed to serving. And when you put yourself in that, the listener is more important than me. The listener is more important than the institution. That's right. Uh, you find answers to questions that are different than the answers you used to get. And not everyone should just, somebody could take the JS100 model and do it here. I think it's brilliant. It could work. Um, but the asking of the question, the very simple question of what problems does this community have that I can help by serving them rather than coming in with what I have and trying to convince them to listen to it. Which is, I think, a generation of public radio has been trying to figure out how to do that and failing. Right. And this is why community engagement is so important. You know, we're doing listening sessions and, you know, going out into the community and inviting people to just come and talk to us about whatever they want to talk about. Um, my friend and contemporary Ashley Alvarado out in California is really doing an amazing, brilliant job at just helping the public find themselves in the mission of, of, of KPCC and LAist. So I think it's being done in a number of ways, even in major, in major markets. Um, but it's something that we should hold ourselves accountable to and never stop doing. That's the one we thing need, we should never stop doing. Yeah. We need to wrap up. That's a great note on. Again, I, um, you know, Eric at MagnificentNoise.com. It's very easy to find me. Lee's a little harder to find. He's kind of, <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. He's, uh, Lee follow underscore me. Hill at GBH, WGBH.org, or at Public Lee on Twitter. I, I want to leave you with one thing that's very important to say. Uh, last night at the reception, I talked to a lot of people. It was so much fun to talk to people. Um, one guy came up to me and said, I'd like to see some, had a couple of drinks. I'd like to see someone debate you. And I'm like, debate? Like, what's the other side of that argument? Inertia? And he just kind of <laughs> looked at me, kind of funny. But then, but then somebody else came up to me as I was walking out and said, it's good to see you here. Do you have hope? Mm. And I immediately responded, yes. And then I spent the whole walk from the museum back to the hotel thinking about that answer. I do have hope for you. I've always said that I want to come back to public radio again at some point in my career. I just want it to be like an exciting place to be when I get there. But, so you can um, stop calling a friend on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Um, living vicariously through their experience. Um, I have hope. I mean, I, I, everyone in my life is pissed off that I'm here. My dogs both had accidents in the house last night. My coworkers are like, why are you going there? My, my family is like, don't bring back COVID because we're going on vacation on Friday. And, and I came here because I have hope for you. And I believe in you. And I believe you can meet this moment. Uh, the, so many people try to, I know I'm going over on time and I'm sorry. So many people approach problems by trying to convince others that they're managing problems or pro problems are smaller than they think or that the problems don't exist. When in truth, the leader you want to follow is the one who says, our capacity to make change is larger than the problems that we face. And you're in the position to do that. It's not going to be easy, but you can do it. Our capacity to make change is larger than the problems we face. Thank you, Eric Newsom. Thank you, Thank Lee you Hill. everyone, for coming.